Hey, what is going on, everyone? I don't know if you can see my slides. Okay, cool. So you can see my slides. Uh, I like that countdown. Felt like I was an athlete walking into a football game. <clears throat> but so nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Rob Lawless, and I'm working on a project to spend an hour one-on-one -on -one with 10,000 different people. I started this journey in November of 2015, and since then I've met over 5,300 people from like 90 different countries around the world. So today I want to share a little bit about that with you and talk about my project and what you can take away from it for networking. So <clears throat> I want you to think about the people around you with depth. That's what I want you to take away from my presentation today. Because throughout my journey, I've realized that the more I interact with the depth of people, the more I acknowledge that it exists. So just as a quick example of depth, this is my friend Boyana, who I met virtually in April of 2020. Now, if you remember, that was kind of a tough time. We were all still doing two weeks to flatten the curve. We were just going to wash our hands and everything was going to be OK. I, at the time, was living in Hoboken, New Jersey, with my friend and his wife and their dog in a 750 square foot apartment. And I had the room in the middle that had one window that looked into a brick wall. So, and I, above me, I had two kids who were probably three and five years old. And every day I can only imagine what they did is wake up, go over to their toy chest, grab a handful of marbles and throw them on the ground and just start stomping for the next three to five hours. So it was kind of a tough time, but when I talked to Boyana, I, I gained a little bit of perspective. So all I saw was that she was from Serbia and we were connecting through Zoom, so from the chest up. And as soon as I talked to her, she said, yeah, it's been a while since I've shared my story, so it's kind of nice to share it again. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. I wonder why she has shared her story before. So over the next hour, I came to learn that in July of 2016, Boyana went to a music festival with her friends and when she was there, she became the victim of a mass shooting. So she said the doctor said she was shot six to seven times. She slipped into an eight day coma. She had to have her leg amputated during that time. And there are a couple things that she told me that have stuck with me. I mean, fortunately she, she's doing well now. She made a recovery. She completed her computer programming degree. She has a boyfriend, she speaks about her story. But the two things that she told me that stuck with me was first, she said when she felt herself losing consciousness, she wasn't thinking about her iPhone or the clothes that she was wearing. She was thinking about her loved ones. And the second thing is she still likes to go out to concerts and whatnot. She doesn't want that experience to ruin that for her. But she notices that every time she goes to put on makeup, her body starts to sweat because subconsciously it associates that act with the trauma that followed. And I thought that was so interesting because it might seem funny or goofy from the outside looking in like, oh, this person sweats every time they put on makeup. But when you understand the context behind it, it makes absolute sense, right? And how many of us in our lives have these little intricacies or ticks or details that people might find funny from the outside looking in, but would make total sense if they just took the time to get to know us? To me, that's depth. And it's something that's always fascinated me. I, I love this word, Sander. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's the realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own friends, routines, worries, ambitions, and inherited craziness. So in other words, all of us who are on this call today, if we're thinking about getting our holiday presents or closing the year out or worrying about business problems that we have or family issues, Every one of us has that universe going on in our mind. We all have a story and we all have this, this lifetime of experiences. So I've always loved that. And I always have had this belief that every human interaction, no matter how brief, has the potential to change your life. And I'm sure all of you have examples of that in your own life. So I wanted to take that concept and run with it. And that's what inspired me to meet 10,000 different people. But first, a little bit of background on me so you know who I am. So I'm Rob again. I am from the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
So I grew up in a pretty traditional family. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, both my older siblings went to Penn State University, so I followed suit. And I kind of come from a family where you're encouraged to go to school, get your degree, find your wife, settle down, have kids, and work your job until retirement. And I was on that path. I studied finance. And after graduating in 2013, I took a job with Deloitte Consulting. So a very structured button-down blazer. Everything was great. I met a girl three weeks before school it out. We started dating. And at this time, my parents were like, cool. We did a good job with our son. We are proud of him. And as you'll come to see in my story, this would change a little bit over time. Uh, when I was at Deloitte, I recognized that I really missed meeting with people organically because at Penn State, I was part of a philanthropy to raise money for the fight against pediatric cancer. I was in a fraternity. I was a tour guide for prospective students. I built houses with Habitat for Humanity. I was a homecoming captain. So I built this very large organic network and made a lot of friends as a result of it. And then when I graduated, I felt like I could only connect with people over networking or dating. I don't know how many of you feel that way today, but it just felt difficult to create authentic connections. So left Deloitte, I went to a tech startup in Philly is doing sales for them. I moved into the city and when I was there, I decided, okay, I'm gonna take this concept and I'm actually gonna start it. So November 11th of 2015, I met the very first person for my project. And over the next eight months, I met about 100 more people. And then the company that I work for, it's called RJ Metrics, they were acquired. And as a result, I was laid off. And at this point, my parents were starting to question where I was going with my life choices. So rather than looking for a new job or going back into consulting, I decided to jump into this project full time. And I started meeting people, like five people a day, I, I moved out to Los Angeles to stay with a friend. I lived in Hoboken, like I mentioned. I've driven across the country six different times. And I met about 3,300 people in person, every single person in person. And then COVID happened. And I'll tell you what, meeting 10,000 people, really cool headline when there is not a global pandemic. But when there is, if you remember, like if one person in your community got it, it made headlines. Guy meeting 10,000 people, not that cool in that scenario. So I shifted my project online and I've met over 2,000 more people since the pandemic began from 90 different countries around the world. And I've had some really nice experiences with it. I've got to share my story with uh, outlets like Now This, The Today Show, The New York Post. In August 2019, I was invited to be on Kelly Clarkson's talk show. And I went out there and it was Kelly Clarkson on the couch and then it was me and Jane Lynch, who's from Marvelous Miss Maisel, and Joe Coy, who's a famous comedian. So it was three famous people and me sitting up on this couch. And I think I'm the only one at the time that was fighting off a panic attack. Um, but what was really neat about it was the producer said, Rob, we know that you spent time in Los Angeles. So we want you to reach out to all the people you've met in LA, which was about 800 people, and invite them to be in the audience. We want the entire audience to be made up of people that you've met through your project. So that's what I did. I DM'd all these different people. And when I got there that day, as I looked out into the crowd, I saw a sea of familiar faces. So I like to joke that I think I was the famous one there that day out of everyone. Um, but it's been an amazing experience. It's had a big impact on how I see the world. And it made me curious about what influences the way that each of us sees the world, because we all have our own unique perspective, right? Now, our perspectives are influenced by a few different things. The first is our biology. So just as an example, I'm like 6'1 on a good day if I go to the grocery store and the cereal's on the top shelf. To me, I perceive that as a, a perfectly reasonable height. But if you're five feet tall and you want that same box of cereal and you go to reach for it, your perception is that it's too high. The second is our wants and needs. So if you look at this picture in the middle here, I say I think that you're likely driving in Texas. I don't know if anyone here is from Texas on the, on the call, but you somehow are always on a highway with desert around you and mountains in the distance. And no matter how long you drive, you never arrive to the mountains. It doesn't make sense to me, but if you have to go to the bathroom and you're hungry, your perception is there are not enough rest stops on this road. So it's influenced by our wants and needs. And lastly, it's influenced by the people we surround ourselves with. And this can be our school communities that we grow up in, our families, our faith communities. All of these people are conditioning the way that we see the world. And 
there is a suggestion out there. There's a number. It's called Dunbar's number. So it's a suggestion that you can only maintain 150 close relationships at any given time. And I think this is really interesting because if they're influencing the way we see the world and we live in an age where someone disagrees with us, we can just block them, we can remove them from our feeds. How does that compare to the total number of perceptions that are in the world today? So what I've done is taken this rudimentary graph here from TikTok and actually what it is is a representation of Jeff Bezos as well. So he's got that massive pile of rice on the right there. And then if we have like a six figure salary, we're sitting with that one grain of rice on the left. But I converted this over to perspectives that exist in the world. And I saw we recently hit 8 billion people on the planet. So congrats to us. So now all those perceptions are represented by that big pile on the right. We go over one more. We have about the population of France. Over one more, maybe an NFL stadium. Over one more, we have maybe a small college campus. So if you wanted to get to that Dunbar's number, that 150 number that is influencing how you think that entire pile of rice on the right works, you would have to split the single grain on the left into 43 different pieces. So 1 43rd of a single grain of rice is influencing how you think the entire pile works. There's a book I read this past year called The Psychology of Money, and in it the author says, your experiences in life make up like 0.000001% of experiences that exist in the world. But they make up 80% of how you think the world works. So how do, how do we get a better idea of this? And I think through intentional connection, we can kind of just inch our way over to having these different perspectives and a better idea uh, of what the world actually looks like. And there are a bunch of business statistics that are kind of pushing us in this direction these days, especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion. They say, uh, ethnically diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform their peers. Or inclusive teams outperform their peers by 80% in team-based assessments. And I think it's great that we're having this push for more human connection, and I think the pandemic really pushed us further into that. But I want to take you from this mindset of, okay, let's achieve this business success, to a mindset that the people around you are just incredibly interesting. In other words, we want to go from letting our business statistics drive a passion for human connection to letting this passion for human connection drive positive business statistics. If you've ever heard of James Clear's Atomic Habits, and he says we want to go from outcome-based habits to identity-based habits. So instead of saying, okay, well, we want to have the team that is outperforming the other one by 80%. So to do that, let's surround ourselves by people who have different opinions than us. And if we do that, great, we'll become a diverse and inclusive company, people that value human connection. Instead, we want to say, oh, I naturally am someone who values human connection. As a result, I expose myself to people and opinions that are outside of my echo chamber. And because I do that, I have teams that are outperforming the ones around me. So I've done this in my life for the last seven years. And I've, I've met people like Sham who've given me feedback. Like, I feel like I don't get enough time sometimes to talk about the stuff I went through in college. So I appreciate you giving me that space. Or Siobhan, who said, thank you for capturing and honoring my experience and existence. It's so healing and helpful to be witnessed and heard. And I thought, OK, well, how did I get to this point where I have people who are reaching out to me, giving me this type of, of feedback? And I knew I was speaking, so I, I did that analysis on my project. I ran the numbers. I looked at the data. And I came up with two possible explanations as to why I've succeeded in this space. And the first here is that I'm just the most charming man on the entire planet. And I know having listened to me for 13 minutes now, you're thinking, OK, he is a cool guy. I would like to hang out with Rob, spend some time with him. But honestly, the other thing that realistically is I've just come up with a really good way to get to know people. And that's what I want to share with you today. So it begins with asking the questions, what am I doing to expose myself to people outside of my circle? And then asking, what am I doing to expose others to my backstory? Because each of these questions have value. It's important for people to know your story as it's important for you to know theirs. That's how we build our empathy and our perspective. And my recommendation for you, and kind of what I want to talk through today is uh, to set a connection goal for yourself, to learn the Ford framework, which we'll go over today, and to reflect on your connections. 
So you might be thinking, all right, connection goal sounds odd. I don't like that. I don't, I don't want to do that. It sounds inauthentic. But when you have a goal to connect with people, it gives you an excuse. And I always say one of the best things I've gotten out of my project is an excuse to sit down with people who are different than me. And I think you could do this internally saying, you know what, I want to be someone who talks to the person behind me at the coffee shop for five minutes, one time a month, or New Year's is coming up. You could say, my New Year's resolution this year is to meet one new person every month in the gaming industry. Or my resolution is to meet one new person a month outside of the gaming industry, because I want that to impact how I see it. So having a goal gives you an excuse. And it gets you to that identity-based habits where people say, oh, well, that's Rob. He's, he meets people. He has this goal. So then they want to help you achieve it. And that's what I've seen with my project. It also allows you to tap into the value of connection or the untapped value that I would say. So through my work, I've seen three different levels of value to connecting with people, like why we want to spend more time doing this. The first is it increases your sense of belonging. So as an example, this is my friend Aaron, who I met in October of 2017. Now, we met here in Philadelphia at St. Joe's University. We donated blood together, had a good meeting, went our separate ways. Eight months later, I'm driving down the road in Santa Monica, California, and I hear this beep from the car next to me. And I thought maybe I swerved into their lane. Maybe I was changing the song on my Spotify. So I kind of peeked over and I looked and there was Aaron with this big smile waving to me from her car. And I thought, oh, that's so cool. I haven't seen her since I met her in Philly. So I tried to shoot her a message on Instagram. She didn't see me. Before that, I had tried to wait back. She didn't see me. And I parked my car and I just thought, well, that was a really neat experience. So I went into my meeting. I came back and I had this white slip on my windshield. And at first I thought, OK, great, another ticket. Because one, I'd been building a collection of them at the time. And two, if anyone here has ever been to LA, the parking signs out there, like SAT questions. It's like you have to do all types of math to figure out if you can park there and you still get it wrong. But anyways, it was not a parking ticket. It was a note from Erin saying, hey, Rob, that was me. I would love to catch up with you. She invited me out to dinner with her and her boyfriend. He was also part of my project. And as I'm reading this, <clears throat> she comes walking up the street. And I gave her a big hug in that moment. And it was just so cool to see a familiar face in an unfamiliar place. And just naturally, the more we expose ourselves to people, whether it's at work, in your community, et cetera, the more often you're going to run into those people and the greater a part of that community you're going to feel. The second thing here is an expansion of our perspective. And I've had this happen time and time again in my project, but this is my friend Fernanda, who I met in October 2018. And we met at this sunny cafe in Los Angeles that's pictured us pictured on the left. And we spent the entire hour crying together because she told me about how a year prior, her brother Eduardo, pictured on the right, was hit and killed by a drunk driver. And to make matters worse, when Fernanda was a little girl growing up in Brazil, her dad was hit and killed by a drunk driver when she was seven years old. So I left that meeting thinking, you know, how could I not be thankful for the fact that I could FaceTime my parents right now, or I could call my brother, or I could text my sister. I think Fernanda reminded me of the finiteness of life that exists for all of us, but she taught me that we can't do anything about the fact that we'll lose the people around us, but what we can do is appreciate them while we still have them. So ever since then, I've moved back in with my parents a couple of times. I, every night before bed, would tell them I love them because you just never know what's going to happen. So spending an hour with a stranger, Fernanda, it changed the way that I spent time with the people I've known my entire life. So there's this expansion of our perspective. And the last thing here is this opening of doors to new opportunities that we otherwise wouldn't be able to create for ourselves. So this guy here with his plane, this is Tyson. I was introduced to him through my cousin, Jill. Uh, when I was living in LA one time, I went down to San Diego and I asked if anyone knew anyone there. So my cousin introduces us through email and he says, yeah, Rob, I, I would love to meet with you. Do you want to go up in a modern or historical aircraft when we meet? And I thought, yeah, that is exactly what I was thinking as well. I would love to do that with you. So I meet Tyson at the hangar. I get in his car, we drive through the gate and we roll up to this plane. First time I've ever seen it. And 
he looks over to me and he says, oh, by the way, Rob, it's amateur built. I built the plane myself. So you don't have to fly in it if you don't want. And I, in my mind, thought, Tyson, you probably could have included that part in the email. Like, hey, this one I built myself. It may have influenced how I felt about this activity. And I know some of you out there are thinking, get over yourself, Rob. It's a private aircraft. There's private aircrafts everywhere. People do it all the time. But never before then or since then have I seen a plane that looks like this. And if you look a little bit closer, you'll see it says experimental on the side. So I was like, okay, well, do I get in this plane or not? I mean, I met this guy five minutes ago. We can fly, crash and die. My mom thinks she raised a smarter son. Or do I do it and have the story to tell? And that, of course, is what I did. So it was a mix between fighting off a panic attack again, uh, trying not to throw up from the G-forces of the turns, and then having just the best time of my life. Because once you settled into it, we were just cruising over the coast of California. And what a, what a pleasant way to get to know someone. So those are the three levels of value to human connection in my mind is this increased sense of belonging, this, this expansion of your perspective, and this opening of doors for future opportunities. And that in my mind is why we should all be a little bit more intentional about connection. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, okay, Rob, well, this sounds interesting. I would like to have those things in my life, but I'm terribly socially anxious, or I'm not a great conversationalist, or I don't know what I would talk to someone about. That is why we have the Ford framework. So I'm going to go through that with you now. The Ford framework, it stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. So family, occupation, recreation, dreams. And I know we're talking about networking and, and making new connections uh, really in like a business sense here, but you could use this framework on a first date. You could use this framework at your kid's graduation party. You can use it at the parent-teacher conferences, whatever. It's, it's just a very easy way to uncover someone else's story. Now, what we want to do with it is think about everyone's life as a timeline. Because we all have a birthplace. We all have a childhood. We all have an education. Mine included working at Chick-fil-A at 14 years old. I don't know how I got away with the child labor laws there. But we all potentially have this university experience. Some of us may have gone straight into to working. We all have a career and we all have a future. So we're really just trying to fill out this timeline by asking questions within each of these categories. And the way that I like to think about it is it's kind of like being an archaeologist. So you don't want to go in with heavy hitting questions right away. Uh, you want to go in gently and respectfully and try to uncover people's stories. Because if you ask them respectful questions, eventually they'll give you the pieces of themselves that you can assemble to have a better idea of what their life looked like. Another thing I like to just tell everyone is the audience cannot see what you do not give them to see. And what I mean by that is if I like to use sports, for example, I am in Philadelphia, so we'll use the Eagles. If I have extra tickets to the upcoming Eagles, Eagles game and I don't know who to give them to, if you have never vocalized to me that you're a huge fan of the Eagles, you're not going to come up in my mind as someone to give them to. But if you have told me that, then that's something I can say, oh, okay, I know this information. I know they're a really big fan of the team. Hey, do you want these tickets? So the same goes for what we're passionate about, what annoys us, what irks us. The more we communicate with people, the better they know us. Because we already know our stories 100%. And sometimes we forget that other people only know what we've given them to see. So the framework I just want to dive into here is, is I'm going to give you the questions that I ask people every single day. So I mentioned I have met over 5,300 people for my project now, and I still meet three people every single day. So actually, this morning, I met someone for my project. After our, our chat here today, I'm going to meet someone for my project. I have four people tomorrow. So it's not something that I've read in a book and I'm passing along. It's something that I'm still putting into practice as well. But I like to start with family. So we think about our lives like a timeline. Our family has a big impact on who we are emotionally. No matter what it looks like, there's no right or wrong way to have a family. But we can acknowledge that whatever it looks like, it has a big impact on who we are. So I like to start uh, every conversation with location, though, and just asking if it's virtual, oh, OK, so where are you calling in from? And if they tell me Philadelphia, they tell me Boston, 
oh, okay, so what part of Boston did you grow up in? I assume everyone grew up in the place that they're currently at. And I let them tell me otherwise, if so, because I just think it's polite. So if they're not from Philadelphia, I have a story that I can build out of how they've gotten here. And if they are, I can ask them things like, oh, well, have you ever left? Uh, what part of the city did you grow up in? So location, it's giving us that establishment of that birthplace, and we can start to build out their story from there. And when it comes to family, I, I ask people, what is your family like? Do you have any siblings? If so, are you close with them? Where do you fall in the order of them? And I also ask people, do you still have both of your parents? And if so, are you close with them? And I ask it in that way because it acknowledges that a lot of us, like Fernanda, have experienced loss. You could also dive into extended family if you'd like. I'm one of 16 cousins on my dad's side. I'm one of 11 on my mom's side. So we can dive into that if you'd like as well. And then as we get into family with adulthood here, we're bringing back that location question. So, okay, well, this is where you grew up as a kid. Where do you live now? And how did you get there? How long have you been there? We can also talk about our relationship status, which is how did you meet your significant other? Uh, what's the story behind that? People always have some interesting stories. And then you can talk about kids too. So do you have kids? Do you want to have kids? While acknowledging that not everyone wants or has the ability to have them. And what we're really doing with the family piece here is if you think about yourself as the main character or this other person as the main character of a movie, we're trying to build out what their supporting cast looks like. So that's the family piece. And as a little breakout here, uh, I would like to know if anyone, uh, or if you could type, type it in the comments, uh, not sure who's on the call, but would love for you to comment where you're calling in from, where you're from, and, and how many siblings if any that you have. So go ahead, feel free to type that in the comments. I would love to get to know you a little bit better because I see my screen, but I know you're out there. So throw them in the comments and we will check them out as we move on here. So I see Western, Western North Carolina, one of two brothers. Nice, very cool. Uh, so we're gonna move on to uh, Jacksonville, Florida, one sibling, nice. So yeah, we're getting a sense of where people are from and what their family looks like. So continue, feel free to, to type them in there. And I'll move on to occupation here, which if you think about the timeline, so family has a big impact on who we are emotionally. Our occupation has a big impact on how we spend our time, right? And the way that I like to think about this is what is it like from an education standpoint? And then what is it like from a career standpoint? So we have occupation, education, career, and depending on if you are see someone here is from Montreal, Canada, so very cool. If you are in the States, you have high school and then college slash university. I know Canada is a bit different in other places of the world. But the way that I like to break it down in my mind is, okay, so what were you like in high school or your country's equivalent of high school? And then what were you like in college or your country's equivalent of college? And I further break that down into academics, extracurriculars, and uh, jobs. So in terms of our occupation here, like if you think about high school, what was your favorite subject? What sports or whatever did you play in jobs? And for me, for example, I liked art and math in high school. I played soccer for four years. I played golf for two years. I was on student council. I worked at Chick-fil-A and I also worked in a financial advisor's office. So that was a little bit about me in high school. And then we get into college or university. Uh, then you can say, okay, well, what was your degree of study and why did you choose that specific field? And then again, you can say, what were you part of outside of class? And did you have any part-time jobs throughout the year? Did you work full-time along school? What did that look like for you? So for me, finance, and I, I studied finance. I mentioned that I was part of a fraternity. I was a tour guide, raised money for the fight against pediatric cancer. And I did internships over the summer at places like Dick's Sporting Goods and the Philadelphia Electric Company. So then we get into our career here, which is basically you can think about this as like your LinkedIn profile if you want. But we're thinking, OK, since you graduated from high school or since you graduated from college, whatever it may be, what has been the progression of your career since then? And I like to tell people, I think of people's lives like timelines. So what were you doing in each of those years since you graduated? So for example, I graduated 2013 from Penn State. I did consulting for Deloitte for a year and three months. 
I did uh, sales for the tech startup RJ Metrics for a year and nine months. I started my project and had eight months of overlap between the sales job and this. And then when they were bought out, I was laid off. I jumped into full this full time. I've been doing this for full time uh, ever since. So like a year and three months in consulting, year and nine months sales, seven years of meeting people for my project. So you can see, right, like it's easy to follow the path of what I've done. And then I also like to ask people, what were, uh, when you were a kid or when you were in college, what did you think that you would be doing when you got older? What was your dream career back then? Are you still on that path or has it differed? And if it's differed, what was the catalyst behind that? So for occupation breakout here, I just want to know if you want to throw it in the comments. Uh, what did you think that you, like, what was your dream job when you were a kid? What did you think that you would be doing when you were older? And then what is the job that you currently have? I'm just interested to see if they are the same thing and if they're different. So feel free to throw them in the comments section. We'll see what, what everyone put. But moving on here, so we have the family piece, we have the occupation piece. Family has a big impact on who we are emotionally. Occupation has a big impact on how we spend our time. And then recreation is kind of like the colorful part of our personalities, like what, what we piece in when we have the time, right? Our free time. And the problem with this is if you're talking to someone and you say, okay, well, what do you like to do outside of work or what are your hobbies? A lot of times people get paralyzed by thinking, all right, I have to tell this person the most interesting thing that I can think of. I have to tell them that I am an ultra marathon runner or that I do carpentry on the weekends. And it's just not the case. We're just trying to get a better sense of who you are outside of work. So the way that I like to ask it is, what are the routine things that you are doing outside of work? whether it's fitness or music or whatever. So what are the routine things that you're doing? And then how are you entertaining yourself? So you can think about what are you watching? What are you reading? What are you listening to? And you could also talk about what are you scrolling through if you spend a lot of time on apps like Instagram or TikTok. So just quickly, I like to go to the gym three days a week. Fitness, I think, is cool. I have two guitars. I took lessons for two years in high school. Right now, I'm trying to learn um, a finger-style version of songs from the La La Land, La La Land soundtrack. I am a huge Eagles fan, all Philly sports fan. We just signed Trey Turner to the Phillies. Very excited about that. I am not watching anything currently, but I'm reading Green Lights, which is Matthew McConaughey's memoir. And when it comes to music, I like everything from hip-hop, like Drake, to uh, Frank Sinatra, to Dave Matthews Band, Jack Johnson, John Mayer, to EDM artists like Major Lazer. So in 30 seconds, you have a better idea of who Rob is, aside from the guy that's just talking to you about human connection, right? You can see what my interests are. And some of you on the call might be like, oh, you know what? I connected with some of those. I do the same thing. Or you might be like, I don't connect with any of those. Here's the things that I do. And we could share that knowledge with each other. So. That's the recreation, and the key for this is to have specifics when you're talking to people and try to pull specifics out of the people you're chatting with because specifics will move a conversation forward. Generalizations will kill it. So if I say, what kind of music do you like? And you say, oh, I like everything but country. I can't really go anywhere with that, but if you say, I like John Mayer, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. What's your favorite song by him? How long have you been a fan? Have you ever been to his concert? So you see how it opens the door for more questions. Now. My favorite question to ask people is, is if you think about your identity as a pie chart, what would be the breakdown of categories of how you define yourself? What would be the breakdown of categories and percentages? And I often tell people, uh, like, I know we've talked about game development or we've talked about fashion or that whatever. So I know that's a piece of your life, but is it 30% of who you are? Is it 80% of who you are? And what are the other categories that make up who you are? This question is great because it, it signals to the other person that you are paying attention to the entirety of them. And it helps you see that person as they see themselves. So I have found through my experience when we're talking to people, we create these assumptions in our mind of, of what their life looks like. And sometimes we can be accurate. Sometimes we could be off. But if we ask them, we allow them to give context to who they are. So. What would be the breakdown of categories of how you define yourself? 
and what would be the percentages. So for our recreation breakout here, if you want to comment in the, the chat, what would be the biggest slice of your pie chart? I, I'm just curious. You can say it's work. You could say it's family. You could say it's my faith. I'm just curious, like if you think about your identity, what's the biggest slice of your pie? So go ahead, throw that in the chat there, and we can look through that as we move on here. Now, the last piece of the puzzle here is dreams. So family, occupation, recreation, dreams, everything that we've talked about so far kind of goes from our birthplace up until the present moment. But our dreams is, OK, so what do we want to do from here going forward? So we can kind of bring those other court categories back into focus here. And you can talk about career, family, hobbies. But just to go through it here, so what is your dream job? What is your, your ultimate goal? Do you hope to put out uh, the most popular game in the world? Do you hope to sit and, and work on games in the background? Do you hope to do something outside of the gaming industry? Do you want to be, for people that you're talking to, maybe they want to be the head of a hospital or they want to be a principal at a school. So, and then if you go outside of the career piece, what are the issues in the world that you would want to solve? Sometimes I ask people, like, if you could snap your, your fingers today and solve one issue in the world, what would it be? Because it tells you what's important to them, whether it's world hunger or gender inequality, whatever it may be. If you solve your career piece, what other issues do you want to work towards? Then we can think about our bucket list. What are the things that you want to do before you die? Do you want to visit certain different places? Do you want to have different experiences? I just met a woman today. She said that Monument Valley, I think, is a place in New Mexico that she recommended me visiting. And maybe my Canadian friend here will recognize, I've, I've heard in Ottawa that there, the canals freeze in the winter and it becomes like one of the biggest outdoor ice skating rinks in the world. So these things, and I, as I talk to people about their bucket list items, it informs what I want to do with mine. So then we can bring the location piece back into, into the focus here as well. Like, OK, if you live in North Carolina, or you live in Philly, or you live in Montreal, is that where you want to be for the rest of your life? Are you happy there? You built your life there? Or do you want to go someplace like London, or Latvia, or Brazil? Is there uh, a city that you hope to live in in the future? And if so, why? So we can get back into the, the location piece. It could be the same. It could be different. And then we can talk about family as well. So do you hope to have kids someday if you don't already have them? If you do, do you hope to have grandkids? Again, acknowledging that many of us don't want or have the ability to have kids. I always say I have a sister who has two little boys. They're like two and a half years old and 10 months old. And I love them. I love spending time with them. My sister and her husband are tired all the time. And I feel so bad for them. But I know that's parenthood, right? And then I have a brother who he and his wife live in New York City. They don't want to have kids. They travel to cool places every year. So I've seen a couple different sides from it. I personally think it'd be great to have kids. So that is in my dreams for the future. So for the dreams breakout here, I will just pose the question, what is one thing that's on your bucket list? What's one thing that you want to do before you die? Very curious to see what that is for all of you. So go ahead, throw that in the chat there. And uh, just to wrap that up, that's the Ford framework. So it stands for Family, Occupation, Recreation, and Dreams. And again, you can use it to, to have any different kind of conversation. It doesn't have to be networking for work, but it could be. It could be a date. It could be talking to someone at a party. And something to remember here is you don't have to say, OK, well, I have to go from family to occupation to recreation to dreams. No, you could start talking to someone about their dreams, and you could float into their occupation path, and then you could talk about their recreation and their family. It's just something to keep in mind if you feel like you are getting to a place where the conversation is becoming stagnant. You can think back, OK, well, which of these categories have I not hit yet? And you can pull from that. And it opens up a door to many more doors of questions and conversation topics. So the last thing here is just, I think it's really important to reflect on the people that we connect with because I think that's how we learn about the people around us and how we lock in the value of what they've taught us. The way that I do this is I keep track of everyone that I meet on my Instagram account. And it's, uh, it's called Rob's 10K Friends, so I take a picture with them 
And I distill their story, what I've learned from them into like a paragraph. I post it, I write how I met them. And it's created for me this kind of visual journal of everyone that I've met and what I've learned from them. And it's fun because I can go back and look at it at any time. And it also, you know, they say if, if you can teach something that you really understand it. So if I can tell someone's story, it means I really took the time to listen to it. If you can write a little journal entry about someone after you met with them, it shows that you actively listened to them. But you could also just follow them on LinkedIn. You could follow up with them on Instagram, whatever. Um, just get in touch through email. But I think reflecting in one way or another allows us to lock in that value. So by doing this in my life, I uh, have actually helped other people go on their own journeys of connection. So my friend Naomi was experiencing loneliness in Boston. And she said, you know what? I'm going to take this concept and run with it. I want to meet uh, one new person or people one-on-one -on -one for one hour each. And she's met over 30 people in Boston now. But it did not stop there. I had a couple cousins in Toronto who said during the quarantine, we like what Rob is doing. We want to try and meet people as well. So they each met over 100 people from countries all over the world. And it didn't stop there. It went over to Germany where my friend Marcel said, I'm going to meet people. I'm going to try to meet one person from every country in 80 days. And he got very close. He didn't get all the way there. But it fascinates me because he went from a Germany network. And think about we're talking about networking here. He went from a Germany network to a global network in 80 days. And now he has all these contexts and he's learned so much about the world. And it actually made its way over to India as well. My friend Tahir said, I'm going to try to meet a thousand different people one on one for one hour each. And he is now, I think he, he's met over a hundred people now. And I, I most recently had a girl from Ethiopia reach out to me, tell me that she's doing it there. And a girl in Long Island who's doing it, but specifically talking about stories of people who grew up with their fathers absent from their lives. So they're taking this concept and people have run with it in their lives. And I think for you, something to remember is if you become more intentional about connection, think about the impact that that will have on the people around you, whether it's at work or in your family or in your community, you can set that positive example for people and create spaces that are more inclusive and have greater senses of belonging. So that's kind of my recommendations for you is to set a connection goal for yourself to, to make sure you have that excuse and to tap into that value. Use that Ford framework when you're getting to know people, whether it's on the train or, or flight, whatever. Reflect on those connections to make sure that it's not just something that goes in one ear and out the other. And when you do that, you're going to inspire others to meet new people as well. So when you do all of that, it will get you back to a, an understanding of that word Sonder, that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. And I'm biased, but I think the more that each of us do that, the better society we are creating for ourselves and the people around us. So with that, everyone, I, I, you can contact me at robs10kfriends at gmail.com. You can hit me up at robs10kfriends on Instagram if you want to be a part of my project or if you just want to see the stories of the over 5,300 people that I've met. But thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome to present to you. I love seeing the comments. Uh, makes, I feel like I'm getting to know you as I'm talking to you. So thank you for participating in that. And if you have any questions uh, at this time, let me know and I'm happy to answer them. All right, so it may, it may be the cold medication talking, but how did you, if I missed this, how did you originally start this campaign to, to meet all the, what was the original thing that you went, okay, I want to do this? Yeah, great, great question. And I think if I remove the slides from the stream, is that cool? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, there you go. Oh, perfect. Cool. Uh, so I started this in, there's a website in Philadelphia called billypen.com, and they were putting out a who's next list, like, who's next in the culinary scene or who's next in the art scene or who's next in the political scene. And I knew I wanted to meet people from a bunch of different backgrounds. So I started shooting pe those people messages on Instagram or because I was in sales, I was pretty good at finding people's emails and sending them a note. And I also wasn't afraid of saying, Hey, can I sit down with you and borrow a little bit of your time? And I just started reaching out to people. And if they didn't get back to me, <coughs> I would follow up with them and not be afraid to do so. And 
So November, I started reaching out to people September of 2015. So it took two months just for the first person to say yes. And then I met one person November 2015. I met th three people that December, three people that January, four people that February. So it took three and a half months just to meet the first 10 people. But then what happened, and I think it, what happens with all of us as we become more intentional about networking, people were like, oh, you know who you should talk to is this person. Or people would tell their friends and say, you guys should meet Rob. I was part of this project. And it kind of went from there. So then uh, media publications started writing articles about it. And then word of mouth started spreading. So yeah, over six, seven years it piled up. But that in the early days is how I got started. And, and see, that is something that's so important. And it falls under like the soft skills that we talk about in business. Because I mean, this industry is extremely tight knit. And I mean, if anyone's been watching the news, all the stuff with, you know, Panda and the Smash World Tour, if you want to crash course on, on how to tube a project, go behind everybody's back and start talking trash like the CEO of Panda did. We all know each other. And so there's there's two big, you know, takeaways that come out of what you just said. One is, yes, you've got to get up that initial nerve to go out and start talking to, you know, what might be random people. But you've also got to have a bit of thick skin to be able to handle it when people are like, no, or they just like flat out ignore you or something along those lines. But, you know, networking is absolutely key in games because that's how a lot of the stuff gets done. A lot of the business. Yeah. And I'll just add to that quickly. There's I think when you make it systematic, like when you say I'm going to meet one new person a month. It, it then you know okay well like if i feel really nervous during this meeting or if i feel like i didn't learn anything you know there's a new one coming and there's a book called a curious mind by brian grazer he's a hollywood producer and he throughout his career has done curiosity conversations so every two weeks he sits down with someone outside of the film industry and he talks about it almost like it's a mutual fund like you're making these investments time and time again and not everyone will pop off for you immediately, like have value immediately. Some might not have value at all, but some will have value immediately. Some will have a tremendous value for you 10 years down the line. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that with my project too, people that I've met years ago coming back into my life and saying, oh, well, we need you for this speaking engagement or you should connect with this person. And it's like when you're systematic about it and you just take that time to enjoy it and make it a regular part of your life, then it's as easy as like eating lunch. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I frequently joke that's, you know, one, I've been doing this for 27 years, but it's like the very low level people that I met 20, 25 years ago at some of these big publishers or, or development studios, they're now the C level, the executives, they're the decision makers. And it's just a matter of, you know, fostering that relationship over years. And it doesn't always have to be like a deep, meaningful thing. It's just like checking yeah. in and say, hey, what's up? what's going on? What are you working on type thing? Mm -hmm. Hold on. I got, I got another cough coming. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Any, you know, last pieces of advice, because I mean, one of the, the big trends that we always see in game industry is, you know, a lot of times we're shy, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're introverts, you know, getting out there and talking to people, whether it's virtually or in person, how do you, you know, make that very first step to get going on it? Yeah, I, I would leverage the things that you're interested in too, and your the communities that you're part of, whether it's a, a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group or a local chapter or something and just try to start meeting people who are already in those shared interests because it's kind of like a safe space. Like you'll know you'll have a shared interest of some sort and you can kind of build from there. And what happened with me is I started getting meeting friends of friends. And then like the woman I met this morning is she was in Johnson city, Texas. And she found me because of a poet from Houston that I met. And he just talked about meeting me and she just happened to follow him. And I met that poet because of another person from Texas that I met. And it's just the chain goes back. So if you start close, you can expand wide. So you don't have to be fearful of like, okay, well, this is a completely random person to me in a completely foreign industry or whatever. You can start close and you'll still get there. And I think another thing, if you're nervous about it, if you feel socially anxious, 
just to frame it correctly in your mind and think, you know, I might not be the most confident conversationalist in my first two conversations with people, but I bet I'll be better with my 20th conversation. So you don't try to be perfect in the first or second. Give yourself that mental space to stumble over your words or for there to be an awkward silence. But know that that too is part of progress to you having very fluid conversations with people down the road. The other thing that happens is when you do it often, your mind naturally builds up this library of topics that you can go to. And the more you pe meet people, even if you can't relate to them through your own story, you'll start to be able to relate through the stories of other people that you've met. So it really just builds on itself. It's really just getting started with the, the early days, not being too hard on yourself. And then value-wise, taking accountability for the fact that, hey, like if I'm sitting down with this person and, and I deem them to have a boring story or whatever, what, it, what was valuable about our conversation? It could be that you now know how to interact with a personality that's different than yours. And it could be something super small. I met a girl yesterday who her Spotify top artist was this guy, Orville Peck, I think his name is. I'd never heard of him. I checked him out on YouTube after. I really liked his song. So I started listening to him. I listened to him at the gym uh, for the whole hour last night. So again, she changed the way that I spent my time. It can be something as small as a song recommendation. It could be something as big as a career opportunity that really sets you up for success. So I think a key is just to be open to all of that. And that's one of the areas where it's actually easier than a lot of people think in our industry because that industry is so global. I mean, even just like, like look at chat right here. You, we've got people from all over Europe and, and Asia and North America yeah. just in this sort of thing. Those yeah. are, you know, wonderful ways of, of starting those conversations and learning, you know, new cultures and, and what's different over here than versus over there. You know, I, I've been in three different conferences in the last like five weeks, hence why I sound like this and I'm coughing and all this other stuff. But it's fantastic to, you know, see these other cultures. And those are really good ways to start the conversations because it's not just it's like your experience isn't the same as the one person right beside you anymore because mm -hmm. you're on the other side of the world literally yeah yeah and i saw in the comments someone said hello from japan and then i saw mm -hmm. a couple of people said their goal is to visit japan so so y'all get together yeah. and do like a house flip share thing for a week and then go take a picture and send it over yeah exactly all right we are we've got a few minutes left we're waiting on the next one to get queued up here and then we'll be ready to flip so what do you think what's been your takeaway with all the different industries that you've seen and the people that you've met what if if, if your project stopped tomorrow yeah knowing what you knew now what would you want to do next what would i want to do next my my goal is well i I want to have, I want to be a professor at a university. It was not a goal at the start. It's just a place that I feel like I have this knowledge now and here's what I can do with it. I would like to be a professor at a university, teach a course to first year students. And that course would look like them pairing off one on one every class period, learning from each other's backgrounds as opposed to a textbook or a PowerPoint, because not everyone is going to be super social and join the clubs and come in and, and find their networks. Some people just need a little bit of facilitation. So I want to have a safe space for people to do that. I want them to learn the skills of active listening, how to tell their story in a clear, concise manner, how to have empathy. And on top of that, I just want to create a space for future business partnerships, marriages, friendships to, to be formed. And I think you do that by giving people the opportunity to, to interact with each other. So I want to do that at one university. I think it's a, a highly undervalued thing that universities could be doing right now. So if and when I do it successfully, then I want to show it to other universities and have it become this thing that as our students go through school, they're building this layer of empathy into their education so that by the time they get into the workforce, they're already valuing things like diversity, and inclusion and equity is not something that they have to be trained on as much. All right. So have you thought about doing that, you know, until you're at the point where you're doing it at university, have you thought about doing that online? Because, you know, some good friends of ours, another organization in the industry, the the gig, the game industry gathering, 
that's basically what it started off as at the beginning of the pandemic. It's like a bunch of people get into a Zoom mm. and then every like 10 minutes or so, everybody pairs off into a group of like four or five mm. and that's it. You just basically introduce yourself and, and you know, talk around. Have you thought or, or looked into doing that on the virtual scale to refine everything? Kind of. There's a, a woman I met recently out of Austin, Texas. She's from Vancouver, but she started a site called Pick My Brain. I think it's pickmybrain.world is the website. But basically, she's calling it like a knowledge marketplace. But it's people who care about human connection. So anyone here could go set up a profile. And the brains, for example, are the, the people with knowledge. And you can go and like book 30 minutes with someone for free just to get to know them and their brain about whatever topic and then some people have paid things too like if you wanted to have advice on your pitch deck or something like that but i am keeping my eye out for these different platforms that enable connection amongst people and she and i i signed up for her service i've met people through it and i'm diving more into that now to see if it's something that i can take and start using to facilitate connections for other people so yeah, it's just and naturally like I came across her through my project. She reached out to me to meet. We spent an hour together and this was for us a result of our time together. That's awesome. That is yeah. fantastic. All right. So we are going to wrap this one up. Let me see who we've got coming next because it's been that kind of, of morning for us. Oh, yes. Uh, our friend Kinga from Airborne Capital is going to be talking about 10 easy steps to fail your investment pitch. So awesome. Rob, thank you so much. You know, I, I, backstage, I've been telling folks, it's like, you know, these are not the normal strictly game industry talks, but these are fantastic because it brings in these other perspectives. And it is like these soft skills that people need to know and they don't always think about. So man, really appreciate your time today. And you are absolutely welcome back whenever. Yeah, thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who followed along in the comments and on the call. And happy connecting. All right. Thanks, All everybody. Right. We'll, be, yeah. we'll be right back with Kinga.